So now that we have data to work with, let's modify that data. Well, when you think about editing a post, there's really not that big of a difference between editing and creating. Now, of course, the SQL statement involved is drastically different between those two things, but the form itself doesn't change very much. In fact, I think we can use the same form for both creating a post and editing an existing post. So let's make that our goal. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is, okay, how do we access the form for creating a new post, and then how do we access the form for editing an existing post? So in other words, we need to design our URL. Well, of course, we have admin and then post. That cannot change. But in order to signify a new post, we could do something like this. We can add another segment to the URL of simply new, and then that would take us to the form for creating a new post. And following this idea, we could also have edit. That will take us to the form for editing an existing post. But we also need to know what post to edit. So we could have another segment to the URL. We could have the ID of a post, or we could use the slug. And in fact, I like using the slug because as far as the user is concerned, that is much more meaningful than just a numeric value. Now we can make this happen by using a feature of ASP.NET web pages. It's the URL data collection. The page that we are currently working with is post, but anything that appears after post is going to be inside of that URL data collection. And then we can get that information and then determine what we need to do. So let's first of all, create a variable called mode. This is going to be either empty for displaying blog posts, or it will have new for a new blog post or edit for editing a blog post. So let's default this as an empty string. And then we can check the URL data collection. If there are any items within the collection, then we want to get that information. So then we can set mode to equal to URL data with the index of zero. That will be our mode. And then if mode is edit, then we can get the next segment in the URL, which is supposed to be the slug. So let's create another variable. We'll just call it slug. We will initialize it as an empty string. And then we can say if mode, then to lower, is equal to edit, then we want to populate our slug variable. So we want to lower equals to edit. Then we will set slug equal to URL data with the index of one. And then in the body of the page, we can check to see if we have a value for mode. So if mode is, uh, let's first of all check for empty. In fact, if this is not empty, then we know that we need to display a form. Now for right now, we're just going to actually display that form. Ideally, our form would be inside of another CSHTML file, and then we would use the render page method. But for right now, this is going to work just fine. Otherwise, let's just have some boilerplate. Let's just say that this should display a list of posts. And if mode is not empty, then we can provide the mode through a hidden field. So let's add an input element with a type of hidden. Let's set the name to mode, and then we will set the value equal to at sign mode. And so whenever we submit this form, we know what mode that form is in. And then our post handler can take that information and do whatever it is that is appropriate for the given mode. Now, before we do anything else, let's make sure that this works. So let's run this, and off screen I changed this to Internet Explorer. I really don't have a reason for doing that, it's just something that I did. So we will first of all get rid of the .cshtml. We are making a request for this should display a list of posts, which is exactly what we should be seeing because there is nothing after post. Now just to make sure, let's add a slash and then let's see what happens. We are still getting the same message, so that is working well. So now let's add new. This should display the form, and if we look at the source code of this page, we should see a hidden input element with the mode of new, and that is indeed working. So now we need to try edit, 
and that should indeed work as well. If we view the source, there we have edit. Okay, so this is an idea that is working very well. But at the same time, I'm not sure that I'm very happy with having all of this code at the top. Now, of course, this is very simple code, but this is, what, 11 lines that I really don't want inside of a CSHTML file. So wouldn't it be nice if we could just kind of break this out into another class? So let's add a new class to app code. And I don't really know what I want to call this class. So for right now, I'm just going to call it post. And I also don't know what folder structure I want to use inside of app code. So this is just going to be in the root of app code and it will just be called post. We can always modify this whenever we need to. So for this class, we're going to add a static property called mode because I don't want to create a new post object just to get the mode. I just want to write post.mode. So let's add public static string mode. And then we need a getter, which is going to use the URL data and then retrieve the appropriate value for mode. Now, URL data is a property of the web page class. That is essentially what we have with a post.cshtml file, except that instead we are inheriting from web page. So we actually have a class called post and it has a property called URL data. So in order to get the URL data, we have one of two options. We can scrap this post.cs file, and then we can create a CSHTML file instead. But I don't like that approach because this is just going to be pure code. So instead, we can use a class called web page context. And this has a static property called current. And then this has another property called page. This is the current page that is loaded into memory that is being rendered to be sent to the client. So from here, we can get to URL data. Now to make our lives easier, we can make a private static web page property simply called page. And then this will have a getter that returns web page context dot current dot page. That way we can just use this page property and then get to the URL data. So here we have page.url data. We want to, first of all, check to see if there are any items inside of URL data. And if there is, then we will return the item at index zero. So if page.url data dot any, then return page.url data with an index of zero. Otherwise, we will just return an empty string. And that is our mode property, except that we have a red squiggly up here. Let's see what this says. Uh, cannot implicitly convert type web page rendering base to web page. Well, that's no biggie. We can change the return type here to web page rendering base, and then the red squigglies go away. So now we can go back to post.cshtml. And down here in our if statement, we can use post.mode is empty, or if it's not empty, then we want to display the form. And then we simply do post.mode. Although actually, let's not do that. Let's use this mode variable, but instead of initializing it as an empty string, we will use post.mode. And then that's just going to make this a whole lot easier. Then we can add another property to our post class called slug which will have the contents of the slug. If there is one, otherwise it will be empty. So let's go ahead and do that as well. So we want public static string slug and the getter is first of all going to check the value of mode. If mode is equal to edit and let's actually do this. Let's do return URL data index zero and then let's make this to lower. That way, everything is normalized as a lowercase string. So if mode is equal to lowercase edit, then we want to get the slug. So we will simply return page.url data at index of one. Otherwise, we will return an empty string. So we can go back to post.cshtml, and instead of initializing slug as an empty string, we can just use post.slug, 
and then we can get rid of the rest of this code. So our code inside of the CSHTML file is a lot cleaner. Okay, so if we have a mode, then we want to get the current post. Now this can be a little bit tricky because we really only have a post if we have a slug. And even then we're not guaranteed to have a post because the slug could be a slug that doesn't really exist. So let's add another property to our post class. This is going to be called current and it's going to be kind of similar to what we have as far as web page context dot current. This is going to be a static property that is going to get the current post. So public static, let's make this dynamic because we are dealing with dynamic objects here and we will call it current. And this is going to simply have a getter. Now in the event that we don't have an actual blog post with the given slug, then we need to still return an object, but it needs to be a dynamic object that has a title and content and all of that other stuff. Basically, it needs to be an object that has a bunch of blank properties. So let's first of all write a method, a private static method that returns a dynamic object, and let's call this create post. Actually, that's not a very good name. Let's call it create post object. And this is simply going to, first of all, create a dynamic expando object. So let's just call this obj and we will new up the expando object class. This resides within system.dynamic. And then we can populate this object with a title property, which will be an empty string. The same thing for content is equal to empty string. And let's see what else. We have the date created, obj.date created. And let's go ahead and just set this to date time dot now. Then let's also set the date published. This is going to be null. And I'm not really sure if we need to do null here or if we need to do something like the default of a nullable date time. So date time and then a question mark. I really don't think it matters because this is after all dynamic. So we can initialize that as null. Let's see what else do we have. We have the slug, which will be string.empty. And then there's something else and I'm forgetting what it is. Author ID, author ID, yes. So obj.author ID. And let's start this off as null. Now we have a choice here. We could write instance members for this post class, and then we could use that as our data type. And I'm perfectly fine with that. But if you'll remember, we are using the database class and everything that we get from the database class is dynamic. And if you start mixing dynamic and static, things start to go awry. So I'm going this route because I'm trying to keep everything dynamic. So let's just return obj here. And then for the getter, we will simply return uh, create post object. Now, we eventually want to take the slug and we want to hit the database, try to find a record with the given slug. If there is one, then we will simply return that. Otherwise, we will create a post object. But to give you an idea of what we would be doing here, instead of using slug, inside of this if statement, we would get the current post. So let's just create a variable called post, and we will use the post class and then current. This will hopefully get the current blog post so that then we could use the post object for the values. So for the title, we could set a value property equal to at post dot title. Then for post content, we would have at post dot content and so on and so forth. So let's go back to the post class and let's hit the database. So instead of returning create post object, let's comment that out. Let's use a using statement. Now we really need to break all of our data access code into a data access layer. And I guess that that is something that we will definitely do in the next lesson. But for now, let's create a database object. So we want database dot open. We do need a using statement for web matrix dot data. And we have the default connection connection string here. 
Then we want to query the database. So let's create a variable called SQL and select all from posts where slug is equal to a parameter. Then let's create a variable called result. We will call db.query single. We will pass in SQL and then the value that we want for our parameter, which is our current slug. So we will just use the slug property. And then we will return result or create post object. So let me clean this up just a little bit, just so that we don't have any extra comments that really aren't there for anything. And let's run this. Although I don't really remember what the post is that we created in the previous lesson. So let's fire up Management Studio. But in the meantime, let's go to admin slash post slash new. Hopefully we won't get any exceptions. We don't. And if we look at the source, we have the value of new for our hidden mode field. And then for the title and the content, we don't have anything there. So the new looks great. So let's also do edit. And then we need our slug. So let's go to Management Studio. Let's connect to our database engine. And let's drill down to simple CMS tables. We want to just look at the information that we have here. And we will just copy the slug and then paste it in. So it is first dash post. So let's go to the browser. Let's do first dash post and let's hit enter and voila. Now the text in the submit button doesn't really make sense here. So we can just change that to be submit. That way it works for both creation and editing. So we can go back to post.cshtml and let's just call this or give it a value of submit and then that will change and that will work. And so we have successfully used the same form for both creation and editing. Now, of course, we haven't added any of the other fields yet, and that is something that we definitely need to do. But before we go any further, as far as actually editing the post, we need a data access layer, because that is going to greatly simplify the code that's going to access our database. So in the next lesson, that is what we are going to do. We are essentially going to create a repository for our posts. It's a very simple concept, and it's probably overused, but it works very well and it will work very well for us within our application.